Okay, for our final presenters in the session this afternoon, we have Luke Darcy of Sigfox and Nalini Venkatasurmanian of UC Irvine. Sigfox is a pioneer in cost-effective, energy-efficient Internet of Things connectivity, and Nalini's group is doing uh, quite innovative research in the whole area of Internet of Things, or IoT. IoT has been dominated by components or things that connect to power sources that can be otherwise recharged in between uses. Luke and his colleagues at Sigfox have developed a narrow-band, long-distance wireless communication technique that allows sensors such as smoke detectors and parking space sensors to report to stations miles away using small battery that can last for years. Um, this research, his research has been partnering with UCI and they've been doing some very innovative things in uh, settings that I'm not gonna steal their thunder, but I think there's a live demo that's coming up. At least that's what I heard. So, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, is there a clicker? Here comes a clicker. <laughs> Thank you. Do watch your time. Thank you. Our slides are up. Oh, there we go. OK, well, hello, everyone. I'm Luke Darcy uh, with Sigfox. And um, I'm going to be presenting along with Nalini um, to talk about what we're doing we're to get um, the Internet of Things connected. <laughs> and the way we see it, then, in, hmm? in the future, probably not in the too distant future, yeah, everything will be connected. So not just computers, not just smartphones, but pretty much every product you buy, probably even down to the packaging of products that you buy. Um, and we're going to get a lot of benefits from that. I mean, we've seen already that um, by connecting smoke detectors, you can save lives. And uh, we'll have the, uh, a video show of the fire chief of Montgomery County near Washington explaining how that works. Um, if you um, can connect bicycles, you can stop people from stealing bicycles. And um, actually, San Francisco City has a big problem with um, cycle theft, and they, they really want to increase the number of people cycling around down there because the traffic's terrible. And uh, this is a big initiative they've got right now. Um, and you, can, you can think of a million different applications. If you can um, connect um, sensors that you put in farmers' fields or even in your garden, you could probably reduce the amount of water needed by irrigation, needed for irrigation by a factor of four. And um, with the winter that we've just had here in California, I think everyone can see the benefits of reducing the amount of water we need to grow our crops. So there are huge societal benefits that are gonna both make life more fun and interesting, uh, as well as um, saving people's lives and, and creating new business models for um, companies. Um, but in order to do that, we need really to look at the technology that's going to be needed in order to connect these devices. And um, one thing that these new applications all have in common is that they're low bandwidth. Now, low bandwidth connections are usually very frustrating. You know, if you're trying to watch a video and it's a low bandwidth connection, you know, it drives you mad because um, the screen keeps stopping. But for Internet of Things connections, like a smoke detector or like a, a moisture sensor in a farmer's field, a low bandwidth connection is exactly what you want. We call it low throughput, but high, high impact. And that's a real mismatch to the technologies that are available today to connect up devices. Pretty much all of the technologies that are available today have been designed for human connections. And what humans want is more bandwidth. And actually, if you take a look at a cell phone and the way that technologies have developed for cell phones over the last 10 years, you can see that people are prepared to accept pretty much any compromise in order to get high bandwidth connections. You know, a cell phone 10 years ago had a battery life measured in weeks. You know, a, uh, an old Nokia, uh, you could take it away on a business trip for a week without bringing your charger. A smartphone today, well, I'm lucky if I can get through a day without needing to recharge my smartphone, but it is a lot faster and I can watch videos and get emails and things like that, so I don't care. Now, for, um, for IoT devices, it's really not, not that simple. You know, actually, um, other, other factors are, are much more important than they are with humans. So, um, really, if you're creating an IoT device, you have two choices. You can either choose a short-range wireless technology or a long-range wireless technology. And neither of them really does what you want. So if you go down the short-range path, you can choose Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. 
But those technologies tend to consume quite a lot of power, so the batteries don't last very long, which is a problem if you're talking about a battery-powered device like a smoke detector or a moisture sensor that goes into a field. And um, they're also very complex to manage because you need to pair each short-range wireless device with a local access point. And that usually means entering some kind of PIN number or access code into um, the device. And now uh, with no UI, either on the access point or on your smoke detector or whatever else the device is, uh, that creates a real problem. Um, in a previous life, I used to sell technology for Bluetooth headsets. And even in that case, where you've got a good UI on the smartphone, some manufacturers still found that 25% of the headsets got returned because people in, in the real market, you know, not techies, uh, real people, um, found it very difficult to handle putting a PIN number into a phone and getting the headset connected. So imagine what percentage of um, you know, garden moisture sensors would get returned in that situation. It's probably more than 25%, and actually no one can make any money um, at that kind of um, rate. So you're, you're really stuck with long-range technologies for a lot of these devices. And long-range technologies, like cellular, actually do work quite well um, for many Internet of Things applications. But there are two problems. One is that you need to charge them up all the time, because really, cellular technologies are just the technologies that you've got in the smartphone, and they've got more power consuming um, over the last few years, not less. So they're going in the wrong direction for IoT devices. And it's also expensive. You know, um, most people pay, through gritted teeth probably, um, $100 a month for their smartphone connection. Um, but, but people aren't going to pay anything like that amount for a smoke detector or for any of the other use cases we've been talking about. It's probably more like $1 per year is more reasonable for those kind of devices. And you're never going to get that with a cellular connection because of the fundamental costs that are involved. So really what we need, if we want to make the Internet of Things work, is a new low bandwidth connection technology that's designed for IoT. And um, that's what we've done at Sigfox. So we've um, designed a network that's designed for um, slow network networking. So essentially, we've, um, instead of focusing on trying to get the highest possible bandwidth, we've created a network that's, that's as slow as it possibly can be. And um, as a result of that, the other side of the coin is that you get a lot of benefits that are suitable for IoT. So for example, with slow networking, you can actually get a full wide area system like a cellular network that's available everywhere, indoors and outdoors, um, with battery life that um, goes for years rather than days. And um, you can also reduce the costs um, so that the cost of the radio in the device is around $1. Uh, and that make, makes it economically feasible to put these devices into pretty much everything. And the network fees can similarly be low. You can get down to $1 per year easily um, with this kind of technology. So how does it work? Well, essentially, it's pretty similar to a cellular network. And Sigfox is a cellular network operator. So we're installing um, Sigfox gateways in base station sites all over the world. Uh, we already have networks that cover the whole of France, the whole of Spain, uh, the whole of the Netherlands. We're working on putting a network in the UK right now. And pretty soon, we'll have big chunks of the US covered as well. We're actually the fastest growing network operator ever in terms of the area of um, land covered. And uh, you know, we're accelerating the rate that we roll these things out now. And we're focused on countrywide networks that provide um, very low cost connections, so $1 radio cost and then $1 per year network cost for the Internet of Things. And we think that's going to enable a lot of new applications. But you know, it's all very well talking about the wireless technology. What's really important is the applications that are going to drive the use of this technology. And um, we've been working very hard with some uh, good partners over in Montgomery County near Washington to uh, develop these use cases. And I'm going to hand over now to Nalini to talk about what we've been doing there. Thanks. So I'm going to talk to you about a project that 
uh, Luke and I have been involved in over the last six months. It's called SCALE. It was a part of a NIST White House effort called Smart America. And the key idea is to essentially bring the Internet of Things and cyber physical systems to the community at large. And the main goal behind SCALE, and uh, I'll explain the concept in a minute, is the ability to take these technologies that are growing, sensing technologies, low bandwidth, high bandwidth communication technologies, and bring them to the folks who are unable to afford them, uh, these very high costly technologies, as well as to the folks who are unable to manage, install, and maintain these different technologies. So SCALE is an example of such a system. Uh, primarily, it consists of um, little sensor boxes, uh, such as the ones that you see here, uh, containing a variety of home sensing technologies, primarily for public safety purposes. They, these boxes, installed in a low-income housing facility that you see over there in collaboration with the Montgomery Housing Partnership, essentially capture data from within the home a lot of the folks in there are seniors living alone. And the idea is the county provides the infrastructure for the data that's coming from these different uh, sensors. They capture things such as uh, the smoke detectors, um, carbon monoxide, air quality, temperature, humidity. Um, we also have sensors on the person, for example, to detect faults by the individuals, especially senior citizens living alone. And that data gets communicated uh, from that county facility, which has the Sigfox antenna installed there. Um, the data goes from there to an Internet of Things cloud that is um, currently in our deployment maintained by IBM. And the key idea here is that on top of all of this raw data, we have a bunch of software technologies that essentially extend the capacity of the data to sense making where we are very quickly able to detect events, safety-related events in the home, in the community, and alert the necessary parties. So for example, when we have lots of these technologies around, it is but inevitable that there may be some false alarms. And therefore, what we have in this whole loop is a confirmatory step where the cloud-based analytics essentially detects an event, we confirm that event by going back to the individual through a third-party web provider called Twilio in this case, where we're trying to confirm that there has actually been an emergency, the person has actually fallen down and needs help. And if we don't get a response or if we get a re response that they do need help, this information is automatically sent to the dispatch center and within minutes you have first responders available on the scene without the person at the home actually might uh, without even knowing the fact that there may be a gas leak at home or there may, they may have actually fallen down and in a, not in a position to communicate. So this is, the power of scale is to be able to bring this to uh, this notion of a connected, safe home to everyone, independent of what their physical ability is, what their economic capability is, and uh, especially focusing on vulnerable populations. So what this, um, the scale project gave us um, is the ability to First, understand the situation, determine what are the suitable sensors that are useful for the purpose of a connected, safe home, and to be extend these, the data coming from these sensors with algorithms that can perform higher level sense making, because what we're not interested in is in the data, we're interested in figuring out if the person needs help. Um, so it allowed us to jumpstart a live test bit of research that is live today. So uh, in fact, all of the data will show you a short, very quick demo a little bit later. We're actually, the, our demo is not here. Our demo is in Montgomery County, Maryland. And we are actually getting live data from there. And of course, in the process, we had to develop the data platforms, the sensor platforms, the test beds, and uh, demonstrate the efficacy of this open data platform. And um, this is a, the scale multi-sensor box that you see here. It actually contains um, a bunch of different sensors, including seismic sensors, air quality, explosive gases, temperature, et cetera. Um, the data goes, um, there are multiple platforms in there, including DIY platforms such as the Raspberry Pi. Uh, there's a Shiva plug in there, and we've also used Arduinos to essentially package this together. While you see that box having that form factor today, we're working towards actually scaling it down quite a bit. The data from there, as we see, goes through many different networks. And part of the ability of being able to put together these 
technologies very quickly is to be able to enable this open systems market where any technology provider, whether you're providing the analytics, whether you're providing a sensor, whether you're providing a new form of network, can easily operate in this plug and play environment uh, very quickly. And I won't talk a whole lot about the techniques, but there are two interesting uh, aspects to our software stack. One of them is this notion of a virtual sensor. Think of it as a graph of operators that gets data from the sensors and processes it to generate higher level events. And the other aspect of it is to take the raw data and the events and pass it through a Internet of Things data interchange. We call this the data in motion exchange. And it's a published subscribe based technology, so people can, or vendors, or entities, sensors, devices can populate the, um, the, the cloud, the Internet of Things cloud here with events, and other uh, interested parties, including software components, can actually subscribe to it. And uh, here's a live, we have a dispatch center that runs um, at the Montgomery County facilities, which essentially constantly monitors these alerting and no, um, alerts and notifications that are coming from the sensors. Um, to sort of illustrate the benefits, we'll have a very short video that is going to be played. I'm not sure if there is something that needs to be done here. Do I just start it? Montgomery County Fire Rescue is very excited to be part of the Smart America Challenge and to participate in the many opportunities it provides for a citizen's first approach to fire rescue service delivery. In Montgomery County, in calendar year 2014, we have had four fire deaths, two of which resulted from non-functioning smoke detectors. This is just one way that we can uh, guarantee that smoke detectors work batteries are changed and alert the fire department when we have a problem and that we can be proactive about preventing those moving forward. The other opportunities that Smart America presents is almost endless, everything from fall protection to monitoring hazardous atmospheres uh, in someone's residence. We are fiercely proud to be a participant in this project. Well, I think okay, big that was a that was a five-minute video, and I don't mean to show, go through the entire video. Um, Keith is looking at me. You're going to play a five-minute video. Um, but uh, to sort of give you a quick even, um, a, a picture, you want to go back to? Yes. So this is a live dashboard coming from within the home. This is provided by one of the partners in the project. This is uh, scale was actually a very large public-private government partnership with many different entities, small companies, large companies uh, alike. Um, and this is live data that's coming in from the home. Uh, um, as you can see, there's data coming in. So this is a small dashboard that a, you could think of that a home user might wish to see. And this is the corresponding dashboard that, for example, a um, county dispatch, uh, uh, dispatch center or county um, response operator would essentially see, getting an idea of, in this, this is a live feed from Rockville, Maryland. Uh, which is where the low-income housing facility is. And we can see that there are some set of events that have been reported in the last uh, period. Um, you can get uh, different sets of views of where those events are reported. Um, you can get, uh, right now, we see zero alerts. So that's good. Nothing bad is happening in Montgomery County right now. Um, and more interestingly, these are live feeds from the apartments and the homes and the uh, deployment in the Montgomery County that we are actually, we have the actual raw data, the sensors going through the IBM Internet of Things cloud, coming back to the uh, sensor here. And um, the virtual sensing capability here will allow us to dictate when those events and alerts are raised and when they can be hidden. So um, in short, that's uh, the scale project and um, Sigfox essentially provides, this is the Sigfox adapter sitting on that box. And the key idea is to be able to provide information through multiple networking technologies. This is especially useful if there was a power outage or an ice storm, as uh, we have seen as the case in the East Coast um, in recent years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.